will please remain standing for the reading from God's Word from Genesis chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 to 21. Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not truly die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden of the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden because I was afraid, because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. It's God's word for his people today. You may be seated. Let's pray and ask God for his help. Father, we come to the pages of your word Tell us about the ruining of your very good creation through human rebellion. But help us also to see your mercy, your grace, your love, and your good and trustworthy word that helps us know you, tells us how to love you, and to walk with you to life. And so we pray that you would help us now in these things that we are about to see and hear for the glory of your name. Amen. You know those days when everything was going so well? The sun's shining, the birds are singing, the cup of coffee was perfect, everything's lined up for a wonderful day, and then it all goes very unwonderful. And later that night, as you think back at how the day began, it feels like 18 days have gone past, not 18 hours. Of course you do, because that's how life in our world is some days. And the Bible teaches that this is because of sin. Now, Romans 8 tells us creation has been subjected to futility. It's in bondage to corruption, groans to be set free, redeemed, saved. And not only has creation been subjected to a futility that makes it unable to fulfill the intentions for which God created it, humanity has also been radically corrupted by sin. So it's not just outside forces that cause our days to go sideways. Sometimes we make a spectacular mess of things ourselves. So how did we get here? 
especially as we saw last week, the very good start that God accomplished in creating all things in Genesis 1 and 2. Well, Genesis 3 tells us it started out as just another day in a very good paradise of God's garden, Eden, wherein a serpent who was more crafty than any other creature God made came into Eden and started speaking to Eve. Now, God through Moses doesn't answer many questions all of you want to ask right now or will ask me afterwards. I don't know if a serpent stood up. I don't know if it was normal for serpents to speak. I don't know why. Eve doesn't seem surprised at this. We don't know where Satan came from, how he took control of this serpent. Uh, Revelation 20 says Satan the devil is an ancient serpent connecting these two creatures, beings here. I mean, many think passages in Isaiah and Ezekiel show how uh, evil originated and the fall of Satan and angels. The the thing is about Genesis 3, it doesn't care about any of our questions. (laughs) It, It is more concerned about the fall of humanity than about the origin of evil or the fall of angels. What we can say with certainty is that evil doesn't originate with God. Uh, Evil isn't God's equal. We're just saying he has no equal. That doesn't mean he doesn't have enemies. Satan and the forces of evil are God's enemies, but they're not God's equal. And that's not just a tidbit of theology, but it's a truth that makes a world of difference. If God alone stands above all things and is before all things, it means he alone is eternal, which means evil is not. Well, God alone is sovereign, and so he doesn't answer all our questions about why. We just know that God is going to get greater glory for himself through ending evil's existence and then the renewing of all things one day soon, he's going to get more glory for himself by doing that than if he wasn't sovereign and ordained at all. And so Genesis 3 doesn't reveal Satan's origin or how he took control of the serpent or why Eve isn't, like, weirded out by it. Genesis 3 just reveals the serpent's crafty strategy to tempt humanity to join his rebellion against God and his creative creation purposes. And, and, and And then how and when we did so, sin and death corrupted God's very good world. So what is that crafty strategy? Well, Satan's plan was to discredit God's word and to distort God's character. That was the crafty serpent's crafty strategy. Discredit God's word and distort God's character. Look at the end of verse 1. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Now there's a whole lie. (laughs) And Satan has been a liar since the beginning. But notice how he lies here. He doesn't come right out and say it, right? He, He sows seeds of doubt that are laced with suspicion to poison our trust of God's word and cast suspicion on his character. Did God really say? Are are you sure? And Satan opens the door for Eve and Adam to walk out from under God's word and put themselves over it. So rather than God's word having authority over them, this temptation here is to place themselves as the authority and God's word under them. Did God really say, can you trust his word? Are you sure? And and, and then the suspicion comes of God's character. He distorts God's character. Why would he withhold the trees from you? Did he say you can't eat from anything in this garden? So the serpent distorts God's character by twisting the command God gave Adam in Genesis 2, 16 and 17. Just look up or turn the page over and see what God actually said. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Okay, now flip back over to chapter 3, verse 2. Look at Eve's response. 
We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So we see the clear twisting of God's original command here first by the serpent. God didn't say you shall not eat of the trees. God didn't say you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden. We don't know. We're not told that Adam extend some extra prohibitions around so they didn't get close, never came close to touching it. So let's not even let's not even touch it. So we don't even get close to breaking the command. We don't know. We just know this is not what he said. And in fact, he said, you may surely eat of every tree except one. You see how the first command is framed? It's, it's dripping with generosity. You may surely go. Go have fun. It's like when I give my kids $20 on vacation. Like, God, I don't care what you spend it on. I mean, deep down, I'm like, please don't waste it. But I mean, I, I, I'm like, hey, go and waste it. Have fun. It's vacation. That, that, he sends them into the garden. You may surely eat of every tree except one. It's dripping with generosity. Look at all that is within this garden. You may surely enjoy all of it, except for this one tree, for you will surely die if you eat it. And so when we see God's word flowing from his goodness, grace, and generosity, we trust that his one no in a world full of yeses is also good, gracious, and generous. That, that, that God is not withholding He's protecting. But when his word is discredited, we begin to suspiciously look at God as a stingy withholder rather than a graciously good heavenly father. So Eve then continues to distort God's goodness by adding that God said, neither shall you touch it lest you die. God God didn't say that. And so the truthfulness of his word is then further discredited. We, we, we're not sure. I don't rem, I'm not sure what God actually said. Maybe, maybe I'm not, I don't know what he really said. And that makes it easier to distort his character. And so what we see here is that Satan opens the door. Eve doesn't shut it. And so then Satan goes in for the kill in verse 4. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so Eve redefines God's good acts of creation into a stingy withholding, which then re, uh, Satan reinforces with more lies. Yeah, we're starting to see who God really is now. You won't surely die. God's keeping you in the dark because you'll be like him when you eat the fruit. God isn't for you. He's holding out on you. And in one sense, again, Satan is half true. This is how Satan lies. They're not just bold outright lies. I mean, they can be, but often. They're these half truths laced with suspicion. Like, they didn't immediately die, correct? Their eyes were open. And after eating fruit, they did know good and evil in a way they didn't before. They rebelled against God's good command. But half-truths are still whole lies. Right? They already were like God. They were made in his image. They were made in his likeness. But the, but the devil hold out more to them. He says, you can be like God. You can have more than his image. You can have his throne. You can have more than being like him. You can be like him and then decide for yourself what's good and what's evil. You can have the authority to tell God what's right and what's wrong. So Satan's crafty strategy is to discredit God's word and distort God's character. And what we see over and over in Genesis 1 and 2 is that God's word is true. He spoke and it came into being. It's powerful. It's right. It's holy. And he's graciously good and generous in all he does. Everything he said and spoke into being, everything he made was good, culminating in male and female, very good. 
And so when we don't believe that God's word is true and that he's generous and good, we begin to think, oh, I know better than God. I don't trust his word. He may not be for me. I actually think he's withholding from me. And then we sin. That whole process is, is sin, but it culminates in the external action of sin. And so on a day that started off perfectly in the Garden of Eden, God's word was discredited, his character distorted, and verse 6 shows what happens next. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. So Eve rebels because she was deceived, which she herself admits in verse 13. We'll look at it in a little bit. She was deceived, so she discredits God's word, distorts his character, and then gives into her desire for what Satan and the fruit held out to her, what they offered. Now, nothing is said about Eve's intelligence here. Nothing said about her ability. It's that she was deceived because she placed herself in authority over God's word and character and gave into her desire for the, all that the fruit offered her. But that's not the end of verse 6. The action that's been rising since the serpent slithered in in verse 1 doesn't reach its pinnacle with Eve. It reaches the pinnacle with Adam in verse 6 as it continues. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Now, of course, Adam was with her. Eve created, or God created Eve to be his helper. So as Genesis 3 opens on this perfectly good day in the very good paradise, Adam and Eve were in God's garden doing what God created them to do as his image bearers. To fill, to multiply, to rule, to subdue, to extend God's glory throughout the world. And then Satan, through the serpent, comes in with this crafty strategy to bring it all down. And he does so by undermining God's created order. He, he undermines God's created order. This whole temptation hinges on not just his crafty strategy, but where the attack begins. Uh, I like how Claire Smith puts it. She says this, It is no accident that the serpent chooses to talk to the woman rather than the man. What this temptation represents, step by step, is the total reversal of God's created order of relationships. The man is to submit himself to God's command, as is the woman. The woman is to accept the leadership of the man, and the man and woman together are to have authority over the creatures. But all of that is turned on its head. Instead, the creature leads the woman, the woman leads the man, and together they doubt and disobey the good word of God. Together they seek to be like him, which they are already. So put another way, the woman listens to the creature, the man listens to the woman, and neither of them listens to God. It's this undermining of God's created order that the crafty strategy to bring it all down begins. And our world is the way it is now, not because of female sin, nor male sin, but human sin. They both were not doing what God told them to do. They both were not listening to how God and to whom God told them to listen to. Now, Satan may have opened up the door to sin, but Eve didn't slam it shut and was deceived while Adam stood idly by and didn't do anything until the fruit was held out to him and he followed his wife rather than God. And so then verse 7 says, both their eyes were opened. It's not until Adam joined in the rebellion that the eyes were opened. That's how verse 7 un unfolds at this rising action is it comes to its pinnacle with Adam rebelling, eating, then the eyes are open. Then they knew they were naked. And so they sewed fig leaves together for loincloths. Now, I don't know where the apple came into, like, human culture for this fruit. One thing we do know is a fig tree is close. So maybe, maybe it was a fig. Fig leaves are also very large. So maybe they went to the fig leaf. I don't know. The only fruit that's mentioned is a fig tree. Um, so maybe, who knows? But it probably wasn't an apple. 
Um, that's just, who knows? Anyways, again, I don't know why I'm even talking about it, because Genesis 3 doesn't. <laughs> don't, don't ask me what fruit it was. I don't know. Let's, let's guess fig leaves. All right, or figs. All right, and then so they f- sewed these fig leaves together as loincloths. Uh, where'd they get needle and thread? Let's just move on, right? Genesis 3 does not care. What is, what is meant here is not, oh, this is where sewing, you know, came into humanity. <laughs> what it is is the first time that humans now have this propensity to deal with their sin on their own. They did not run to God. They started dealing it on their own. And then what happens? They heard God. They heard God coming in the garden and hid because our solutions to our sin, guilt, and shame are never sufficient. Yet, even as this judgment comes for the first time, it's merciful. Um, like when I, when I hear something going on that I know is wrong in the house, uh, especially if it's like disastrous, I don't come strolling in very calmly. But God is walking in the cool of the day. And rather than saying, what is the meaning of all this? Calls out, where are you? I mean, it, it, even when judgment comes for the first time, it's just soaked with mercy. So God doesn't end everything the moment they eat. He lets their eyes be open. He lets them know they were naked. He allows them to sew fig leaves together. He he allows them to, to even go hide. He doesn't end everything in an instant. What we see is that even in judgment, God's going to begin to reorder his disordered creation. And so he starts with Adam in verse 9. Where are you? And the language of verse 8 of the man and his wife again point to Adam's ultimate responsibility he was given in Genesis 2 to lead. And then when he couldn't do that without a a helper suited for him, God created Eve in a designed role to be his helper. And this is why God calls Adam to account first, even though Eve sinned first. Because God is reordering the disordering of his creation. And so this disorder is then on full display in verses 10 through 13 as the perfect harmony God created is shattered. And we see it being put on display in the first game of hide-and-seek in world history that also set the record for the shortest game of hide-and-seek in world history. Uh, Adam does not hide very long at all, and we know as soon as God says, where are you? He pops out and says he was afraid because he was naked, so he hid. And then God asks him again, and and just, in what mercy, what patience and mercy? Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I command you not to eat? And Adam takes responsibility and repents, and everything is okay. No. (laughs) Just when you think Adam can't get any lower, he goes lower. He blames Eve, even though he was there and didn't lead her or take dominion over the serpent. He didn't remind Eve of what God actually said. And then he realizes that's not enough. So then he goes even lower and blames God for making her. When just a few verses earlier, if you remember, he cries with delight at the good gift she is from God. So what we see here is uh, Adam makes God his problem. You, you gave her to me. And then Adam makes God's helper into an opponent. So rather than using the strength God gave him to love God and fill the earth with God's glory and to lovingly serve Eve in helping him do the same, Adam uses his strength to try and take God's place, to decide for himself how the world should be run, And then he uses his strength to serve himself at Eve's expense. So he throws her under the bus to try and save his own skin. Now for the moment, before he deals with that, God continues reordering then by turning to Eve in verse 13. She says, what what is, he says, what is this that you have done? 
And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. Now she follows Adam's lead, but further into sin, by making excuses and shifting blame. So they're both guilty, and both try to deal with it, which is now all of our propensity to do. First, we try to cover ourselves, so they try to cover themselves, and next, by then shifting the blame away from themselves. And all this does is just highlight their guilt. It further highlights their guilt, doesn't do anything about it. Adam should have ruled over the serpent. Eve should have helped him to do so. But instead, she listened to the serpent, and Adam listened to her. And so both are guilty of upending God's created order, yet both blame everything else. But then for the moment again, God continues his reordering by speaking to then the serpent in verse 14. Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now this is a little side note, but God tells us what to do when temptation comes. He doesn't start talking with the serpent. He doesn't have a conversation. He just tells them what's going on. Same thing Adam and Eve should have done when the serpent started to tempt them. Don't have conversations. <laughs> Don't just start, telling, start, start speaking God's word when the temptation comes. Start looking to God. Don't have conversations with the devil. God doesn't. He doesn't ask the serpent any questions like he asked Adam and Eve, right? He just goes right in and he curses the serpent. But we see, again, in the midst of judgment, a promise, a merciful promise. A serpent crusher will one day be born. I mean, even when God is judged for the first time, his judgment is filled with mercy. He's a merciful God. One day a son will be born who's going to triumph over sin and evil and death once and for all. This, this son, this serpent crusher, is going to do something about this curse that's been placed on the serpent. But he won't be born without great pain. So God turns to Eve in verse 16 and says, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. So Adam and Eve are still called to multiply and fill the earth. And by now, that original mandate they got, God has said before the foundation of the world, I've ordered these things to be, so one day a son is going to come. But this blessing of child, children, bearing, bringing them forth, is not going to come with great pain. And not just in the actual bearing of children, the birthing process. Uh, I, and I can, I, I can only talk about it secondhand. Um, but it doesn't seem to be anything I ever want to do. <laughs> so that is great pain, and you know. But it's not just in bearing them, giving birth to children, but in bringing them forth, raising them, raising them into adults who fulfill their image-bearing purpose of continuing the work God began in Genesis 1. Now having this world filled with more image-bearers, whose lives then produce more image-bearers, so that the glory of the Lord covers the earth as the waters cover the sea, that whole process is now, from beginning to end, going to be filled with great pain. And even though modern medicine makes this much safer in first world countries, it's still dangerous, even in first world countries, as it's been for most of history. It's been one of the most dangerous things for women. And it's still very dangerous in much of our world. But even when children are delivered safe and healthy, parenting is going to be filled with great pain. As many of you know firsthand, that pain doesn't end the moment your child turns 18. A child becoming an adult doesn't end the pain. Sin partners great pain with the blessing of children now from beginning to end. And so God then continues in verse 16, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. The harmony, then, of God's original purpose in creating men and, e uh, men and women, uh, equal yet distinct, similar yet complementary, is shattered by sin. 
And so God's not prescribing what's going to happen. He's describing now this curse that sin, uh, of sin that's entered our world. It's going to result in a pattern that can, uh, of pattern of conflict that contradicts God's created order. And it was on display in Genesis 3 as Adam and Eve held uh, this dialogue with Satan. Adam uh, did not lead in those moments and then used his role in God's created order to distance himself from Eve to save his own skin. And Eve didn't turn to Adam to be his helper in those moments, to carry out God's word, and she gave in to her desire and then turned to Adam to have him follow her into her sin, which he did because he didn't lead. And God's judgment of this disordering is that there will be a persistent pattern of mutual strife in human relationships, especially marriage. Now, there's some debate about the ESV's translation, contrary to, you might have a note in your Bible, um, it is more of an interpretive translation, uh, but it does fit with the context of Genesis 1 to 3, as well as Genesis 4, where in verse 7, God says almost the exact same thing, while Cain is angry that God rejected his offering but accepted Abel's. So if you look at chapter 4, verse 7, in that moment, God says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, towards you, for you, but you must rule over it. And so sin desired to, to dominate Cain, to control him, to master him, but he must resist and rule over it. So at the very least, whatever you think about Bible translation philosophy, what, what is clear in Genesis 3.16 is God's created order of the complementary marriage relationship between husband and wife has been dramatically distorted by sin. And so rather than the perfect harmony that God created it for and God ordained in the first marriage in the world at the end of chapter 2, God describes now the fallen reality of desire meeting rule in a persistent pattern resulting in ongoing conflict. So Kevin DeYoung, very helpful here, in uh, helping us see this truth. He says this, wherever husbands are domineering or abusive towards their wives, this is not a reflection of God's design, but a sinister perversion of it. Again, God's not descri uh, prescribing things. He's describing now sin's curse. So it's a sinister perversion of it. The marriage relationship was supposed to be marked by a mutually beneficial headship and helping becomes a fight over sinful rebellion and ruling. God designed sexual difference for one another. Sin takes sexual difference and makes it opposed to one another. And so what God designed to fit in a beautiful, harmonious complementarity has then been twisted by sin, which is going to often result in opposition and conflict. It doesn't have to. It's not always true, but it's going to be a persistent pattern in human history. So God reorders the disorder, but in our fallen world, desire will continue to meet rule, resulting in ongoing conflict. And so then God turns in judgment towards Adam in verse 17, and he says, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life, Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you instead of just abundance of fruit and food. And you shall eat the plants of the field, but by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And so God turns in judgment towards Adam, not only for eating the fruit, but as verse 17 starts out, for listening to his wife rather than God. It does not, again, this can be taken very sinfully and has. It doesn't mean husbands don't listen to their wives. It means he listened to his wife's words that were contrary to the revealed truth of God's word and then didn't follow God's word. 
So it's not if it's about never listening to your, your spouse. It is about listening to God. And he didn't. So he didn't listen to God, but rather his wife, who was receive, deceived, but Adam wasn't. He willfully followed his helper rather than use his strength to serve her by following God's word and then leading them both to rule over creation together and maintain its purity. And so Adam is the leader here in this, which is why when God reorders his creation, the pinnacle of the judgment falls upon Adam. God renders the death sentence he said would come in Genesis 2.17, if they ate the fruit, upon Adam, because Adam gave it to him first. He gave it to him initially. And so Adam wasn't only uh, Eve's leader here. The Bible talks about Adam being the head, and not just Eve's, but humanity's. So this is what Romans 5 says about this. Romans 5, verse 12, makes this clear. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men, because all sinned. So one man, Adam, all men, not just males, humanity. So I know the word head brings up many things for some that the Bible does not teach. We're going to talk more about this next week in 1 Corinthians. Right? But head is never an excuse for sinful domineering of others. All right? Genesis 3 and, you, and Romans 5 use head to mean representative, the leader. Adam is all humanity's representative head. And since we're all in him in the garden, Romans 5, verses 12 to 17, we all sinned. Again, it's another one of those truths in the scriptures that do not get laid out step by step for us. We were just in Adam, so we all sinned. Which means when you're born, you are already a sinner. Even though you haven't done an action, so to speak, that is sinful, that transgressed a command. We were in Adam when we sinned, so now we all have this sinful nature. We were all in him in the garden, we all sinned, and so now we all return to the dust from which Adam was made because he's our representative in those moments. So then God not only uh, pronounces judgment upon Adam and Eve, he then curses the ground. So again, notice, the only things that are cursed are the, the ground, the world, creation, and the serpent. Adam and Eve are never cursed. Uh, there's judgment pronounced, but they're not cursed. And so the ground then is cursed, uh, and it won't yield fruit like it did at first. It's now going to produce weeds and thorns and thistles. And rather than work being enjoyable, work is now a toil. Uh, it's, it's not always. Some of you enjoy work, and, and, and you enjoy what you do. It's just that toil is going to be a consistent pattern of living in this world when it comes to our work. And all creation is going to groan under this curse of sin, including our bodies. So when the ground is cursed, it's representative of everything in creation being cursed. It's not like just the dirt got cursed, but the trees are fine. Everything is now affected by sin's curse. So last Sunday, I briefly mentioned some realities uh, that weren't part of God's original creation intention of giving us bodies uh, that tell us the truth about us. Uh, now, because we live in a fallen world and we have sin natures, but also our bodies are affected by sin's curse, there's, there's realities that result from humanity's fall that, not, that were not a part of God's uh, intention of giving us the good bodies of our or good gifts of our bodies. Okay, so just a reminder, um, what's a man and what's a woman? Uh, a woman is an image-bearing female human whose body is designed around the potential for procreation by gestating life within herself. And a man's an image-bearing male human whose body is designed around the potential for procreation outside of himself in complementarity with the woman. Right? Now, in our fallen world, there are realities that cause real pain 
when it comes to what the Bible teaches about the reality of Genesis 1 and 2 and God's original creation, especially sex and gender, like infertility, uh, gender dysphoria, and congenital conditions that affect sexual development. So infertility and miscarriages are realities in our world. They're painful realities uh, that affect in different ways male and female. But we're not less of a woman or a man if you experience them. Uh, what's true is you're a woman or man whose physiology can't or doesn't move, as we saw in that definition, from potential to actual due to sin's curse. Okay? So you have the body that's designed around a potential, but just because it doesn't become actual doesn't mean you're not a male or a female, a man or a woman. The being able to move from potential to actual is now hindered by sin's curse because we live in a fallen world. So that also means when we age or need certain surgeries that remove things that are part of God's original design, we're still men or women because our God-designed physiology is organized around the potential to procreate, not the actual. So this is also true of what's known as intersex. Um, this is a, uh, one of the first arguments that it often gets pointed to by transgender activists or in uh, transgender ideology uh, that, oh, there's this real condition known as intersex. And so sex is not binary. Gender is not binary. But when they do this, they, they do it in a very dehumanizing way. They're trying to humanize, but they actually dehumanize people when they, when they make these arguments. And so, um, if, you haven't, um, if you haven't encountered this, I'll try and explain it in a, in a, a better, or in a clear way quickly. Um, but we need to be aware of this, because as soon as you say sex is binary, the first thing that you're often going to encounter is, oh, but what about? And it's intersex. Um, sex is identifiable at birth for 99.98% of people. Okay? So what, what the current ideology likes to say is it's way higher than that, but they include in their numbers things that aren't truly intersex. So for the 0.02% of people whose sex is really not easily definable uh, or uh, identifiable, sorry, not definable, identifiable at birth, their biological sex can still be discerned through chromosomes, hormones, and the internal structures that are there that support what's known as our gametes, our gamete production. Um, and again, I'm not answering those. You're going to just Gonna, we can talk about those later. Okay? So, but your body is producing these things be, because of your XX cells or your XY chromosomes, male or female. And even when gender and sex is not easily definable by your external sexual organs at birth, you're still male or female because God designed the physiology around a potential which internal structures still support. So it's untrue to say sex isn't binary because there is a true condition of intersex. Our bodies reveal our sex and gender even if it's not easily identifiable at birth. And we have to start saying identifiable, not assigned. Don't, uh, let's start using different terms. When you say sex is assigned at birth, you're just kind of walking into the trap that we can assign our sex. Sex is not assigned, it's identified because God designed us. And when it can't be identified easily at birth, that doesn't mean you can't identify it. And in fact, our medical establishment knows this because to actually healthily care for someone whose external sexual organs aren't easily identifiable, to give them good health care, you have to know their bodies. And they do. And so our bodies reveal our sex and gender even when it's not easily identified at birth. And it's actually dehumanizing to tell someone they're not male or female or that their body doesn't tell the truth about them. To say 
to say that there's this God-ordained ideal, and then to not also say this is a re result of the fall. It's not, that, it's not that you're not male or female, but that there's real curses that are painful realities for some people. And so then to tell someone that it's actually telling them they're not human. If you're not male or female, you're not human. It, because God designed male humans by this physiology ordered around a potential, not the actual. And our, our culture loves the actual. Right? We are, I shouldn't say we are, our culture is obsessed with external sexual organs. Okay? And so it's actually very dehumanizing for someone to say that because it's not easily identified, you're not male or human, or male or female. I like how uh, Abigail Favalli writes it. She says this. The most humanizing and precise way to view this, um, she calls them uh, congenital conditions that affect sexual development. So the, pr the precise way to view this is understanding these conditions not as exceptions from the sex binary, but as variations within the binary. And I love that because it still says you're male or female, but sin's curse has affected your ability to move from potential to actual. It's not that you're not male or female. It's that we live in a fallen world. And so then lastly, sex is binary and our bodies tell the truth about us, but this curse of sin, the brokenness of sin, means gender dysphoria is a confusing and painful reality for some people. I'm not, not talking about the debate about um, people using what is a real thing um, towards their own debased, sinful desires to act on them. So I'm not saying how some people say they have dysphoria. I'm talking about the real, confusing, painful reality of some, that, of, of gender dysphoria. And that's when biological sex uh, is at odds with the inner sense of gender. Uh, and it is real, and it is a painful reality for some, and it does create de uh, deep disharmony within a person when they experience it. And our culture's answer for someone who experiences that dysphoria is to move from brokenness into wholeness by transitioning your body to match the inner sense. But that can only be the case if you believe the first lie in the garden, that God's word isn't true, and that God isn't good, or isn't for you, and that our bodies, even though affected by fall, are still good gifts from God that tell us the truth about us. And so, brothers and sisters, sin's curse brings a deep and wide brokenness that affects everyone and everything, and does so in different ways. So, we must proceed with compassion when we face a brokenness that maybe we have never faced. And if you read about this particular brokenness, uh, I, I, I don't know if you can actually ever truly empathize or sympathize, whatever the right English word is, with someone who does face this dysphoria, that, does, that is feeling this disharmony. And so we have to be compassionate even in those moments if we face a brokenness that we've never experienced. And we can do that when we believe that we too are broken, ruined sinners, but have been saved all by grace. That maybe another person's brokenness I've not experienced, but, but, but I'm not better. I too have a, a nature that's been ruined by sin, but I've been saved by grace. And that too is not just a theological tidbit that we put in a sermon the truth that makes all the difference in the world. And I can't say it any better than Samuel Ferguson. He says this, Christians are in a state of transformation too. So look how, how he does it though. Look at the, the play on words. Being changed from a life characterized by sin into, and brokenness to becoming more like Jesus. I don't like it. That's why I like the word transformation. But we're, we're all in a state of transitioning. God is not leaving us how we are. But we can't use the word transition because of the, the baggage it has in our culture. But we can use the word transformation. You, you are not who you once were 
and today you are not what you want, will one day be. We too are being transformed. We're being changed from a life characterized by sin and brokenness to a life that is more like Jesus. The transgender movement's agent of transition is the scalpel. Christianity's agent of transformation is the Holy Spirit. The transgender movement sees change as primarily cosmetic on the surface. Christians understand change to be inner and deep. And it begins in the soul. It moves through our character. And then it culminates in a perfected, imperishable, embodied existence where we will dwell face to face with God. Which means, friends, our hope is Jesus. For all of this, from the fall to all the implications and results of sin's curse, our hope is Jesus. Our hope is the wholeness, peace, and life God gives sinners in Jesus. We need to talk about things. We need to be equipped to talk about what the Bible teaches about God's original creation and the fall. But our hope is not winning an argument. Our hope is not our country believing sex is binary and our gender matches the good gift of our bodies God gave us. Those would be good things, and let's pray for it. But our hope isn't fixing our world if we just try hard enough. Our hope is in our merciful God. The God who, in the first few moments of Adam and Eve's rebellion, came and sought Adam and Eve when they sinned and ran from him. Our hope is the merciful God who among the curses and judgments of humanity's rebellion and our insufficient attempt to fix it promised one day to conquer sin and death once and for all and restore his people's relationship with him by making us and this world one day all new. Our hope is the merciful God who began fulfilling that promise he made By taking the life of animals to cover Adam and Eve, hinting in those first few verses after the fall at how that promised son is going to accomplish the crushing he will do of sin and death through the shedding of blood. The fall of humanity and our world is great, it's painful. We are in this mess we're in because of our rebellion. But as great as our fall is, God's mercy is greater still. And that's our hope. That we know this promised son now that was promised in Genesis 3 to be God's very own son, Jesus Christ, who Romans 5 says is the second Adam. Through this one man came sin and death, but now through the second Adam, through the second man, Jesus Christ, we have life. Jesus, the second Adam, lived and loved God in every way that Adam failed. And so Jesus was the perfect substitute to stand in our place and take the death sentence our sin deserves. It's Jesus who shed blood covers us and gives us peace with God, brings wholeness now, and a wholeness none of us can imagine one day soon because he is coming again to make all things new. And that's our hope. Our hope is Christ alone because Christ will conquer the curse of sin. Christ is going to swallow up death forever. Christ is going to take our frail, broken, ruined bodies and make them imperishable so that we will live with him forever to never experience sin again. You know, we don't, I don't, I mean, you're going to get up in a few minutes and you're going you're gonna to be like, oh, he preached a long time this morning. That's because of sin. Not that I preach long. <laughs> but that you're like, back's ache and things go wrong with us. But he's going to swallow up death forever. And for all those who hope in Jesus, His resurrection body is the first fruits of what we are going to experience forever. And I can't wait to race you all in New Jerusalem. See how fast we can run. And so our hope is Christ our long. So friend, if you're here today and your hope is anything but Christ, know that it's never going to give you the promised life that it holds out to you. That this world is only going to do what we see in the garden. 
If you turn from God towards anything else, it's going to result in death and more pain. So hope in Christ today for the wholeness you long for. And five points, let's proclaim Jesus as the only hope for our broken world. Let's pray. Father, we, we come knowing that we are in the state we're in because of our rebellion against you. And the results of it are great, but we praise you that your mercy is greater still. And so we pray that you would make us people who hope in Christ alone. You would send us out with the message of the great hope that ruined sinners and creation have in Christ. And I pray that you would make us wait and long for the day when Jesus comes and makes all things new. Do it, we pray, for the glory of your name. Amen.